All right, welcome everyone. My name is Karuna, and I'm honored to be joined by Delson Armstrong. We're here at Damasuka Meditation Center, and we'll be answering some frequently asked questions about the twin practice. So to start out, Delson, this question comes in all the time. I have a knot in my forehead, and it's kind of a headache. Is that tension, or what should I do with the tightness that I'm feeling? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a common uh, occurrence, especially when you're trying too hard in the practice. So when you get a tension in the forehead, that means that you're starting to tend towards or you're already at one point of concentration. And you're trying too hard to stay with your object of meditation rather than allowing it to be collected around that object. So as soon as you notice that tension, what you have to do is pull back your attention, pull back the, the it's really the craving for staying with the object, pull that back, relax, use the six R's, and come back with a more open and collected mind. Mm. Right, yeah, I know that can be challenging because you want to stay with the object, but it's more of a releasing the hindrances until your mind stays on its own, right? You're not forcing your mind to stay. Exactly, because the moment you start to force your mind on the object, you're also suppressing the hindrances. And when you do that, it might feel good for some time, but then later on the hindrances will come back with full force and you won't be able to have the uh, ability to, to recognize them and let them go. When you do it in the practice itself, all you're doing is you're observing the object of meditation and you're six Ring anytime your mindfulness, your attention sways away from the object. So if you try to push and uh, pin down the attention on the object of meditation, that is wrong practice, that is wrong effort. All you're doing is you're observing and then relaxing the mind around that object and keeping it there, just watching it. Don't have to do anything else. As soon as you see that the attention has been fully away from the mind, uh, from the object of meditation, then you use the six R's and you come back. So. When you do feel tension, take that as a sign of you're pushing too much, you're trying too hard, and recognize that, use the six R's, pull back, and just gently, softly stay with the object in meditation. Okay, thanks, that's helpful. So, related to the above, when I six R the feeling of tension in my forehead, it just won't go away. Uh, I really want to get rid of it. That's exactly it. You really want to get rid of it. That's craving. That's longing. Uh, that is counterintuitive to how the six R's work. If you try to do the six R's, if you force the six R's, if you push the six R's, you're not actually doing the six R's. So you notice the tension there. Okay, you recognize the tension is there. Take your attention away from it. Bring it back to the intention of relaxing, which keeps the mind tranquil, keeps the mind serene smile, return to your object, and repeat again if the tension arises. What you have to notice is when you relax, it's opening up that tension. It's letting it go and it might become softer. And it might come back again as a hindrance, but it'll become weaker. How do you know if you're doing it correctly? You know you're doing it correctly if it becomes weaker and softer and finally fades away. If it becomes stronger, if it becomes more tense, then you know you're pushing too much and you're trying too hard. And instead of using the six R's as a way of letting go of craving, you're actually infusing craving by saying, I want the six R's to work in this way. That's not going to happen. You just have to let it go using the six R's, watch the melting away of the tension, stay with that, stay with the smile, then stay with the object, returning to the object. It might come back up again. All you do is let it go again, and it'll become less and less uh, uh, painful, less and less tense, and eventually it will go away. Yeah, another thing I know that's common is people will run the first four R's, say, and they'll forget about returning to their object. Uh, And Bonte often says this is like trying to bake a cake while you're missing an ingredient or something. Right. So you have to use all six. Yeah, a lot of times people try to modify it and they say, well, I can just recognize and I can release and I can return. But they forget the two crucial steps, the relax and the re-smile. There's a reason why we do that process in the way that we're doing that process. 
because it's fulfilling right effort. When you recognize, you immediately have mindfulness. You're, you're recognizing that there is a hindrance present, but you have equanimity. You're not fighting it, you're not pushing it, you're not pulling it, you're not doing anything with it. You're just saying, okay, here is a hindrance. You release your attention away from that hindrance, and then you relax the mind and the body. You relax that tension. Every time you relax that tension, you are letting go and abandoning craving. And you experience this very vast, open, spacious mind that's like a cloudless sky. Once you have that, you've experienced some form of a mundane mini nibbana. But that's not the end. Then you bring up the enlightenment factor of joy by coming back to your smile. You uplift the mind, which makes it easy for it to be naturally collected around its object. Once you smile and when you return, then you fulfill that whole process of right effort by first generating a wholesome uh, thought or a wholesome state of mind and then returning back to it, you're maintaining the awareness and attention to that wholesome state of mind, which is the loving kindness. All right, another very common question is people who say, I can't bring up the feeling of loving kindness or keep it going. What do you suggest for them? Yeah, so for that, I would say stick with the smile for a little bit. Use the smile. So sometimes people might uh, not be able to feel the loving kindness in their heart and won't be able to feel it in their chest. But as soon as you use the smile, you become joyful, you become uplifted, you become happy. And then that immediately starts to bring up the feeling of loving kindness. So if you stay with the smile and make it just a smiling meditation for most of the day, you'll start to see that your mind becoming uplifted starts to remember moments that can generate loving kindness, it starts to recall things with gratitude or just has a more lighter mind. That's the whole point and that's how the loving kindness comes up. So sometimes what will happen is on retreat, for example, somebody might come up and say, you know, I just am not feeling it and I, I don't know what's going on and I'm not feeling this whole loving kindness and things like that. There's two things that can be done. One is either there is a block so that block can be dealt with through, through forgiveness practice, and that's a separate set of instructions where you come up with, by using certain statements, uh, what is that block? Uh, second, secondly, you can use intuition to ask, why is the loving kindness not coming up? And it might either tell you that that block is there and you can 6R it, or it might tell you that you need to forgive this person or this situation or yourself, and that really frees up the flow of loving kindness. Finally, what happens is on retreat, sometimes when people don't feel it, uh, we could recommend them not to meditate for the half of the day and just go out. Uh, you know, if you're in, in the retreat center and if there's like nature around, just go walk in nature or spend time at the park or at, at a lake or something that where, you know, you can just have fun and enjoy yourself. That keeps a light mind, that keeps an uplifted mind. And what you realize is later on, like Bhante will say that he'll recommend this and then later on people will come up and he'll say, so how was the meditation? And they said, we didn't meditate, we were just doing this and that and we were having a good time and smiling and laughing. And exactly, that's the meditation. Having an uplifted mind, having a light mind is a result of that smile, is a result of laughing, is a result of keeping things lighthearted. And that really starts that flow of loving kindness. Mm. Yeah, something that helped me that you mentioned in your guided meditation was that there's different ways to bring up the feeling and three of those being gratitude, uh, then picturing either a baby or a cute animal was another. And then also the phrases, may I be happy, may I be yeah. free from suffering. So there's different ones that might resonate with different people. Yes, absolutely. So another question is people are kind of skeptical of the smiling a little bit. They say, yeah. does smiling really work? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely it works. Uh, there's been research done where they, they, they basically, what it is is you take a pencil and uh, you grip the pencil with your teeth and you hold on to it. And basically what that does is it creates a curvature, upward curvature of the mouth. And that basically tricks the brain into thinking that you're smiling. And so it starts to release all of these feel-good chemicals and you suddenly feel happy. So research has already proven that when you smile, 
it creates this feedback loop effect where when you smile, you feel happy, and when you're happy, you smile. So the smiling absolutely works. The more you smile, the more mindful you are as well. Mm. So a lot of times people will ask the question, you know, I might be driving to work or I might be on the computer or I might be having dinner or I might be doing this and I just don't have time to meditate or how can I keep the loving kindness going? If you can smile, you can meditate, like Bhante says. And that's really true. I mean, the smile suddenly keeps you rooted in what's happening in the present. And that's really the whole process of mindfulness is to be able to observe how your mind's attention moves. And the smile helps you to keep that awareness open, keep the mind free, keep the mind soft. And so the power of smiling cannot be um, talked about enough. You know, there's always an emphasis on smiling. Right. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, we're not talking about a massive smile, just the corners of the mouth is all it really takes to uplift your mind. And that's a good point that you bring up because it's not, not just bringing up the corners of the mouth, but the smile also happens in the mind and in the heart, which means, uh, you know, you could have a, like a little Buddha smile. All of the images you see of the Buddha, he's, he has a little Buddha smile. And if you have that and you maintain an uplifted mind, mm -hmm. maintain a, a very free and open mind, then you're smiling in your mind. If you have naturally loving kindness towards yourself and you accept yourself, then you, you're smiling with your heart. Mm -hmm. So if you do these three things, you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to add, funny enough, there's been a lot of studies on people who have had Botox and they physically couldn't <laughs> stop smiling and they've been shown to be happy for that reason, not because of the Botox specifically. So. There you go. Yeah, that's important. Don't go for Botox. <laughs> But yeah, and fake it till you make it really yeah. does seem to apply to the smiling a little bit. Yeah. So do you use the six R's to get rid of a hindrance or how do you use them exactly? Mm. I, 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 get the, I get the feeling that that question comes from a slight aversion because to get rid of a hindrance means that you really don't like that hindrance being there in your mind and you're using the six R's with that intention of aversion. If you have the equanimity to be able to say, here is a hindrance, so you have the right attitude of saying, you're recognizing a hindrance is there. You're not saying, oh, I really don't like this hindrance here, or if it's sensual craving, oh, I really like this here. You're just noticing it. You're recognizing it, and then you use the release step to take away your attention. You relax, you re-smile, and you return, and then you repeat whenever the hindrance arises again. But the whole point is the six R's allows you to let go of a hindrance. It doesn't allow you to get rid of it. Because as soon as you use the words like get rid of, as the question implies, that means you really don't like it being there. Right. First, you have to change the, the perspective on that and say, it's only a hindrance. The hindrance is just a really good thing to show you where your attachments lie. That's one of the things to understand about a hindrance is it's, it's a teacher. It's a teaching tool. It, it shows you, okay, this is where the mind has its attachments. This is where the mind gets, you know, disturbed. And once you are able to recognize that and let that go, then you're actually doing right effort. Then you're actually doing the meditation process, which includes that wisdom and insight part of the whole twin process. Mm. Yeah, I guess instead of thinking about it like a six R this and six R that, boom, 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 uh, it's helped me to more think about it as relaxing into the hindrance yeah. a little bit and then not keeping attention on it. Yes. Repeating the other R's. Yes. Do you use this? Uh, we just did that one. How long should I do the release and relax step when I six R? A minute, seconds? How long does that process take? Well, what I'll say is the whole six R process is like a wave. So. It's not like you have to like really focus on, am I recognizing? You don't have to focus on, did I release rightly? Did I relax correctly? Or did I, did I smile? Uh, did I uh, return properly? All of these things you have to let go of and just do it. Like Nike says, just do it. You know, It's just basically seeing that they're in the seeing of the hindrance you're recognizing. So you don't have to say, now I'm recognizing. You don't have to be like, okay, recognize. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then you have to be like, okay, now I'm going to release. Okay, now I'm going to relax. Okay, now I'm going to uh, smile. Now I'm going to return and so on. All you have to do is just let the process unfold naturally. So if you're doing it correctly, it should take no more than a few seconds. A couple of seconds uh, would be ideal because all you're doing is you see the hindrance, you take your awareness away from it, you relax, you smile, you return. It's a matter of three to four seconds at the most. Right. Yeah, Bhante uses the phrase rolling your R's. Rolling the R's, yeah. 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 That's a good way of putting it because it is really a rolling. If you just take a pause and wait in one place, then you're giving the opportunity for the hindrance to arise again. And then there's an opportunity for doubt to arise and it'll be like, okay, I think I made a mistake here. Let me do it again. You know, mm-hmm. just do it. Do it with uh, rolling the R's. Just yeah. smoothly do it. And then if it comes up again, do it again. If the hindrance comes up again, do it again. That's all you have to do. Don't have to th- overthink it. You don't have to even think about it. Just allow it to happen. Yeah, and I feel like the other potential uh, pitfall for folks is trying to 6R too much. You're not off the object. It's just a thought that's part of... It just yeah. comes up, but it hasn't taken you away, and people try to 6R everything. Yeah, that's one of the instructions I give for people in the beginning is don't worry about any background thoughts that you might have. You know, when you're first starting out meditating, there'll be all kinds of thoughts percolating up, but they won't be grabbing your attention. They won't be pulling your attention away. You're just sort of aware with your mindfulness that there is this uh, mental energy going on in the back in the form of those thoughts. Only when your mind's attention is completely off its object and now it's looking at that background thought saying, oh, I'm taking this as an object, I'm really interested in this. That's when you 6R, that's when you recognize that there is no longer mindfulness of the object of meditation and you use the rest of the 6R to just bring it back. So it's like an anchor, you're just bringing it back to the object of meditation. The other thing is, when you do the six R's too many times, what you're doing is you're creating all of this energy. You're creating all of this restlessness in that process. Now, you know, you don't even give the mind the opportunity to actually return properly to its object of meditation and you just immediately recognize, oh, here's a thought, let me, rec- let me six R that. So you're not actually doing the meditation at that point. All that's happening is the mind is getting scattered and it's actually becoming worse than rather sharpening the mindfulness. Mm. Another question here. I get sleepy while meditating. What's your solution? Yeah, so sleepiness, uh, right off the bat, I would say, are you getting enough sleep? I mean, this is something that I commonly hear, and and practitioners sometimes during retreat want to be very gung-ho about it and be like, you know what, I'm here to meditate, so... I'm going to just forego my sleep and, and or sleep less and meditate more. And no, 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 no. You need to have a balance. You have to eat properly at the right times. You have to have enough sleep. Whatever that means for you, you have to have enough sleep. Obviously, you don't want to oversleep because that can create slot and torpor. But you want to be able to have sufficient sleep so that when you wake up, you don't feel groggy and you're ready to take on the day. Now, in the meditation itself, there is the slot and torpor that arises and there's different ways to deal with it. Number one is sometimes the mind is dull because there's not enough joyful interest in the object of meditation. So just bring up a little intention of joyful interest and what that does is it kind of focuses like a camera lens, it kind of focuses the attention a little more. So the energy rises up a little bit more and the dullness and the sleepiness goes away. If that doesn't work and the sleepiness continues on, then there are other recommendations, practical recommendations that the Buddha has given. Go out into natural light or turn on, you know, the light as, as much as you can and meditate. Or go to a shade where there is, where you can see a lot of light, but you're not directly in the light and you can just use that as a way to keep the mind active, keep the mind energetic rather than dull. If that doesn't work, then go for a walk or go for a run. That really energizes the body. If that doesn't work, wash your face, you know, just with cold water. And ultimately, if that doesn't work, take a nap. You know, you might need a 20-minute nap, 15, 20-minute nap. It really does wonders. And then come back 
do a little bit of walking meditation, and then come back and sit and see how the mind is then. No Red Bull or no? I wouldn't recommend it. I'm not a big fan of that. Okay. <laughs> I don't drink caffeine at all, by the way. Mm. Yeah. It, I mean, it's not, it's not a bad thing, but, uh, you know, people drink coffee in the morning and that's fine, or they want to drink green tea or whatever it might be. What I do is compassion meditation. That's my, that's my pick me up mm. first thing in the morning. Awesome. <laughs> uh, how much attention should be on visualizing the spiritual friend versus watching the feeling? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, it's really a balance. Uh, you're, you're really staying with the object, which is really the loving kindness. So some people like to really take it to a whole other level and really visualize their friend there and you know their features, and it's like they're almost here in front of them and things like that. That's all not necessary. Even if you just have the idea that your spiritual friend is there and you're sending it out. So it's more like 70% feeling the loving kindness and 30% spiritual friend is here. Hmm. I'm used to watching my breath. This may be people from, coming from Vipassana. Shall I synchronize the breath to making the wishes for loving kindness? No. Not at all. Uh, this is not a breathing meditation, and more importantly, this is not a verbalizing thinking meditation. So the verbalization is used in such a way that it brings up the feeling. You do the verbalization and you allow the feeling to come up. So this is really a feeling, medita feeling meditation. It's, it's really feeling that warm energy of loving kindness in your chest, or later on when it comes into the head, then you're radiating it. But this is really all about just keeping your mind and your attention on that feeling. It's not about the thinking, it's not about the breathing. If you synchronize the breath, then you're no longer actually using the feeling as the object. Now you're using your attention to stay on the breath. And if you're synchronizing and controlling it, there, that is miles and miles away from what TWIM is all about. I can't really do the loving kindness and would rather go back to breath. I used to do a lot of breath. Yeah, I, I noticed that sometimes people have this. They have certain kinds of tendencies or certain kinds of practices that they've done in the past related to the breath. And that's really just an attachment to that practice. And one of the recommendations I have when people come to learn this practice, the twin practice, or they come on retreat, is just for that duration of the retreat, just let go all of those practices and just really sincerely wholeheartedly try this practice and see if it works for you so i would say uh, majority of the time don't focus on the breath don't go back to the breathing practice make an effort i mean you don't have to strive and push hard but make an effort to just see for yourself how this loving kindness meditation works and if you do want to use the breath then there is uh, a recommendation of how to use the breath and it's not done in the way of you know controlling the breath and things like that it's really in the same way as twin which is you're watching how mind's attention moves with using the breath as a as a reminder as sort of like an anchor but in itself it doesn't make it concentrated but i i would rarely give that kind of instruction or any recommendation because primarily for my own self and from my own experience the metta meditation or the Brahma Vihara meditation has worked wonders. So, uh, and a lot of people who, who have gone to do breath in the past and then moved on to do loving kindness, they find that they drop that practice completely and they're just good with the loving kindness. So it's just a matter of really letting go of those clinging to old practices and making an effort to really pay attention and really make the the determination to to try this practice right yeah most people progress quicker with the loving kindness and to be quite honest i haven't met someone who wasn't able to get the practice after trying it and i've been on a lot of retreats here yeah what if i have a lot of doubts about the practice that's a big hindrance yeah 
Doubt is a big one, and uh, it really depends on the situation. I mean, if you have doubts in terms of the instructions, then you approach or you send an email to one of the guides or the teacher, or if you're on retreat, uh, ask the teacher and ask them, okay, I just wanted to clarify the instructions with you, and then go and do them. But in the practice itself, while you're sitting down and you have a doubt, like I was mentioning earlier, like, am I recognizing correctly, or am I doing this correctly? All of those things see them as hindrances and just let them go by seeing them as hindrances means you're recognizing them, taking your attention away from them and relaxing, and then smiling and returning. That's all you have to do. So if you have doubts about, am I 6 r correctly, 6 r that too. Uh, which means that if you have an idea that, oh, I don't think I did the, the relaxed step correctly, or I don't think I you know, returned properly, if you have doubts like that, then do another cycle by letting go of those kinds of thoughts and coming back to your object. Hmm. I think it's often talked about that there's three big doubts, a doubt in the teacher, the teaching, and, and, one, and the taught, and oneself. Yeah. And I thought about the fact that when we're doing in the morning, we uh, take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Yeah. And each of those is an antidote to each one of those doubts. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. That's, that's absolutely so, because you're making a determination to say, when I take refuge in the Buddha, I'm taking refuge in, in the teacher, I'm trusting the teacher. When you make a refuge, take a refuge in the Sangha, or the Dhamma, rather, then you're making an effort to say, and a determination to say, okay, I'm ready to really take on this practice. And then with the Sangha, it's really not only just a community uh, with you at the retreat or whatever it might be, but in your own self, yeah. in your own mind, in the, the ability and capacities of your own mind. And so one of, the, one of the things about the hindrance of doubt is it can arise because in the past you have come up with where people have doubted you or you've doubted yourself. You have to let go of that. And if it requires some kind of forgiveness practice to be able to forgive that, you might want to do that for a day and then come back to the practice and you'll see you have greater levels of self-acceptance and it's much easier than to just do the process rather than questioning it every step of the way. Yeah, I remember when I was starting out, my biggest doubt was, you know, all these other people have gotten it, but I don't think I can get it. Yeah. And it's, I think everyone, to, maybe not everyone has that, but it's this idea of, oh, well, you know, I'm somehow special and I'm the only one who really can't get this. Yeah. Yeah, and I've come across people like that and that, that's really coming from some level of, uh, you know, there's different kinds of conceit and one of the conceit is like, I feel inferior in some way and that's just a level of insecurity that you have to see as a hindrance and just let go of and trust in yourself, trust in the practice, trust in the teaching. When I pick a spiritual friend, does he or she have to be perfect or kind of a saint? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I mean, some people like to use, uh, well, when Mother Teresa was alive uh, as a spiritual friend or the Dalai Lama and things like that. I mean, you know of them, but you don't know them personally. The way I like to bring up a spiritual fr or recommend that people bring up a spiritual friend is think about somebody who naturally uplifts your mind. Think about somebody that who naturally brings a smile to your face. When you, when you think about them, you are naturally at ease. Of course, there are certain parameters to the spiritual friend. They have to be of the same gender. They have to be alive. Um, and they can't be, you know, a family member. So, so once you fulfill those and then you think about somebody who just naturally uplifts the mind, just stay with them. How strong does the feeling of metta have to be to progress in the practice. Don't, yeah, I would say to uh, this that don't worry about uh, the strength of the feeling. So long as you can feel something, you're on the right track. Sometimes the metta will change in the sense that it might become larger, it might become more radiant, it might become more intense or whatever it might be. Just allow that feeling to do what it's doing. But so long as you can notice a feeling, that's, that's all that's required. Once I get a feeling of metta, do I keep repeating the phrases? No. You repeat the phrase only one time. 
And then after you repeat it, just allow the feeling to come up from that phrase. Sometimes the, the metta will dissipate and disappear. And some people, what they like to do is use the phrase again as a way of guiding the metta back into their, uh, into their awareness. And that's fine. But what you're going to find eventually is when you progress in this practice, the verbalizations drop altogether and the feeling just naturally flows with your intention. So you don't need to say the verbalization over and over again, because the moment you do that, then that becomes a mantra meditation. That becomes a thinking meditation. And that's not what we're doing here. We're just using that as a tool to bring up the feeling, let go of the verbalization, and rest your awareness on the feeling itself. I'm feeling some joy now. What to do next? I'm very happy to hear that. That's very good. <laughs> If you're feeling joy, let it be there. The main thing that you have to understand is things will happen in the meditation where you start to actually experience different factors of the jhana. And that can include the joy, you know, the sukha and, and things like that. But don't allow the mind to deviate from it, meaning deviate from the object of meditation. And then don't mistake the joy for the loving kindness. So my caution there is, Okay, you experience joy, that's a wonderful thing, but don't get detracted from staying with the loving kindness. There's a difference between the feeling of joy and the feeling of loving kindness. The feeling of loving kindness is soft, it's gentle, it's very warm and, and welcoming and so on. The feeling of joy that you experience, especially as a factor of the first jhana and the second jhana, is more exuberant it's more vibrant, it's more energizing, and so you feel something else. And you'll feel it in the background, you'll feel it as a, a rising of a jhanic state. But don't think that now you need to shift your attention to that. Let your awareness and let your attention be on the object of love and kindness and stay with that. And the joy will, you'll see, if what happens is if you stay with the joy instead, eventually two things can happen. Because of your intention or your attention to stay there, your, your feeling of joy will actually become even more elevated and it can become uncomfortable. And people have done this and they feel different things like they might even start to feel anxious because the joy becomes so energizing. Or the second thing is if you try to make that joy the object of meditation, the joy will fade away and then you will think mistaking the joy for loving kindness that you're not able to bring up the feeling of loving kindness. So let it be there. It's a wonderful thing that the joy is there, but it will dissipate on its own. Just let it do its thing. It might just glide up, it might just slide up and then glide through and then dissipate on its own. But all throughout that process, if your mind is on the feeling of loving kindness, then you're on the right track. Okay, so I feel like my hands or parts of my body are missing. The body is very calm. What, what does this mean? And what do I do? So this means that you're getting into the third jhana. The third jhana is really where the mind becomes very tranquil. And at this point, the joy completely dissipates. And what is left is the sukha that we talk about. And the sukha is the feeling of happiness in the body, the feeling of comfort the feeling of uh, relaxation and tranquility in the body. And so what's happening is because your mind is getting calmer and calmer, you're starting to lose uh, feeling in the body. And it doesn't mean you lose feeling in the sense that if somebody touches it, you won't feel it. If a fly lands on your hand, you might feel it and so on. But this is a sign that you're getting into the third jhana. And let it be. Don't, don't make a big deal out of it. Don't put too much attention on it. Notice it that it's a factor but stay with the loving kindness. Okay. And then also, so the feeling of loving kindness has moved up to my head. Mm. What do I do now? Okay, so when feeling of loving kindness moves up to your head, you also want to notice a few other things. Number one is, how long were you able to stay with the feeling of loving kindness? Uh, and was your mind able to quickly recognize when it got distracted? So the times in between when it got distracted and you were with your loving kindness are shorter, but the times where your mind was on the loving kindness are much longer. And when I say longer, I'm talking 
5, 10, 15 minutes at a time, it, beca it becomes undistracted. This is a sign, along with the fact that you start losing complete awareness of the body and you're just starting to just see the loving kindness in your head, this is a sign that you are in the fourth jhana. And at that point, the teacher will say, congratulations, you have now become an advanced meditator. And they will give you further instructions, which are known as breaking down the barrier, which is an intermediary practice. You do it only one or two sits, maybe just one sit. And then you'll, give, you'll be given further instructions of how to radiate the loving kindness in uh, six directions, uh, six individual directions, and then all at the same time. And what is the purpose of this breaking down the barrier practice? It's, it's, a, it's a process of basically, you go, what, what happens in breaking down the barriers is you, you are introduced to three other spiritual friends. So you have like four categories. Uh, three spiritual friends, because you already did one spiritual friend before. Uh, four relatives or four family members. Four people that you know, but not so much. You know, somebody who might you know at work, but you're not really friends with them. Or it could be your delivery guy or somebody you meet at the store or the store clerk or whatever it might be. That you just have a friendly interaction with, but not necessarily know them as a friend. So four of those people and then the difficult people, the people that might be considered enemies or people who might have a difficult time with you or things like that. And what that's doing is really starting to soften the mind even further, getting it ready to be able to radiate it indiscriminately in all directions to all beings. So it's a gradual process of actually making the loving kindness even sharper and stronger, but not in the way you think, which is it becomes intense but rather making it so that it doesn't have any judgment and it can be sent out without any kind of prejudice, without any kind of hesi hesi uh, hesitation or apprehension of who you want to send it out to. And what does it mean to radiate the realm of Viharas and how do you do that? Yeah, before I go on, I also want to un uh, make people understand that when you're able to do that part of the practice, you're able to then send it out to whoever, whoever you want. In other words, while we're talking right now, we could be radiate, radiating loving kindness to each other. Uh, when I go uh, away from here and I meet somebody else, I can be radiating loving kindness to them and you can be radiating loving kindness to that person as well. So this process enables you to be able to send it out to whoever you want and whoever you meet. But as to the question of the, the radiating process, of how do you radiate, first of all, you send it out in individual directions for about five minutes at a time. And that process is not pushing. And there's no specific direction. In other words, you can do it in whatever random order you want. It's not like you need to do it in this direction and then another direction next and then a specific way of doing the directions. Personally, what I do is I send it out in front, back, right, left, down, up. But somebody could send it front, left, right, down, up. Whatever you want to do, you do. And when you're radiating, what that means is you're not even radiating from the head. By the time you start radiating, you're going to get into what is known as the arupa jhanas. And what that means is you're no longer feeling your body. Now you're in the mental realm. Now you're in the process of mind. So you're, you're basically thinking of this direction or you're, you're imagining or visualizing this direction, however you, way you want to do it. And you have the intention and the feeling of loving kindness. And your attention towards that direction leads that loving kindness in that direction. And that's all it is. So you're just observing the loving kindness flow in this direction. And then after five minutes, you notice loving kindness flow in the backward direction and so on and so forth. So radiating does not equal pushing out the loving kindness. Radiating equals looking at a direction or feeling a direction and observing the experience of loving kindness or any of the Brahma Viharas flowing in that direction of your attention. It's really hard for me to send loving kindness to each direction. Sometimes I get a headache. Yeah, if you're getting a headache, then that means you're pushing too hard or you're pushing 
In other words, there is a tendency for people when they begin to get this practice and they immediately think, okay, now I'm going to send loving kindness here. And the tendency is to feel like a pressure here in the front, in the forehead, thinking, okay, that means loving kindness is flowing. Or feeling a, uh, a pressure in the back, thinking now the loving kindness is flowing from here, or the right or the left, or bottom and up. But like I said, it's not about feeling it in the head. It's not about radiating it from the head. It's just you're in the mind now and you're observing the feeling of loving kindness. So when you notice there's a headache, when you notice that there's tension, when you notice that there's pushing going on, pull back. Six are that relax, feel the tension dissipate and melt away and just have the intention of sending it in this direction and just observe and watch. Okay. So you're, and when you're, pointing it in a direction, you, it's not like you're necessarily visualizing it going out, right? You're just kind of knowing it's going in that, in that direction and then you bring right. up the feeling and just kind of let it do its thing on its own. Exactly. And you know, the thing is people kind of get creative. Some Somebody had once asked me like, can I visualize like sort of like a lighthouse where it's just radiating in this direction and this direction. I said, okay, if that works for you, that's fine. The whole point is to be able to ultimately radiate in all directions. Now, if you're going to radiate in all directions, and if you're doing it in the way of pushing in one direction, imagine the kind of headache you would have <laughs> when, you're direct, when you're radiating in all directions. So when you're radiating in all directions, it's just an experience of like, you're not even in a bubble, it's just an experience of expansion of loving kindness. It's just an experience of this, this fear or this radiance just going on and on and on and on. There's no pushing going on. It's just happening. It's just flowing. Do I keep sending loving kindness no matter what feeling comes up? Okay, so I, I have to break down that question because if it means no matter what feeling is coming up, uh, that could be a painful feeling, that could be a pleasant feeling, that could be a neutral feeling. And if that feeling distracts you from that loving kindness, you six are it and you come back to the feeling of loving kindness. But eventually what you will notice is if you're doing the practice correctly, when the Arupa jhanas, the loving kindness does change, but you don't have to change it. You don't have to push it. You don't have to do anything with it. It will change on its own. That feeling will turn into compassion and there will be a certain quality to that compassion. Later on, it will change to joy and there'll be a certain quality to that. It will change later on to equanimity and there'll be a certain quality to that equanimity. And then finally, you let go of all Brahma Viharas and you stay with mind, which has become completely tranquil. And this is what we call the quiet mind. But nowhere in that process are you trying to push that ha to happen. You're just observing how it naturally unfolds. That's one thing to remember. The second is, yes, you continue to radiate, but if the feeling, whatever the feeling is, distracts you so much, that it takes your attention away from it, then you 6R and then come back and continue radiating. Thanks, Delson. That was really helpful. My pleasure.